The biggest stumbling block I've faced in trying to explain to people why banks' debt and money matter is the model of loanable funds that dominates neoclassical economics and that is the way that most policymakers think about how lending actually occurs, which justifies leaving banks' debt and money out of macroeconomics. What I want to show now is how the improvements we've made to Minsky, thanks to the support from the Kickstarter funders, has enabled me to put together a simple model where I can show loanable funds in as it is believed, but in a completely monetary model, which Minsky enables, and then re very rapidly change that across to a model of endogenous money to show the importance of banks, debt and money in macroeconomics and why you must include the financial sector in any model of macroeconomics. Well, the first step is to define a godly table. This will be the banking sector's view of the economy. And there will be reserves. And then the liabilities, which are the, in this case deposits, are those deposits of the consumer sector, deposits of the investment sector, deposits of the workers, workers, and then finally the bank's net worth or equity. And I'll say there's an initial deposit of 100 by the consumer sector. Pardon me, it should be a minus, which turns up as a, of course, that's reserves of the banking sector. And that's the starting point. Now, to show the loanable funds vision of how lending occurs, first of all, I have to show lending from the uh, consumer sector. This is the way it's modeled in. Krugman and Eggerston's appendix. Uh, so I'm going to have lending from here, ending up as a flow of money into the investment accounts, using a convention of Minsky that flows from positive to negative. Interest payments, which of course are flow in the opposite direction. Repayment. and the bank is just an intermediate here, so it char charges the intermediation fee. So that's going to be a transfer from the consumer sector that's actually making money out of this. Across to the banker's net worth. I'll keep on going from there and show you the um, uh, a, a, a fully structured model shortly. As you can see, these, these have now been, the flows have now been entered into the Godly table. The uh, columns, the accounts are defined. You can see the subscripting going on there as well. Next, I'll show you uh, the, the, the important feature that Minsky now supports that's come in courtesy of the Kickstarter funding. I've added a few more rows to show the op financial operations in the overall model. Now what I want to do is start seeing this not from the point of view of the bank sector, but from the point of view of the other agents, the consumer sector, investment sector and workers. So I can bring down another godly table here, label this for uh, the consumer sector, so... and then say I want to see what assets are available to use in the system. And I have a click down here, well one of them is the deposits of the consumer sector. Now that's therefore an asset of this uh, consumer sector. If I press a plus column, you'll see all the operations that were recorded for the uh, consumer sector across in the banking uh, sector's view of the economy are now shown here. So I have to show that against uh, uh, other elements. So you can see the row sums are no longer summing to zero. So there's consumption by bankers. Uh, let's come down here. There's uh, the, the lending itself occurring here. I have to show they're turning up of a, as a liability. So I'm going to choose this as a liability and call this loans. And that of course means that the lending increases the loans. And now if I look at the row sum, that row sum is now calculated to zero. So I've now properly recorded that financial transaction and I'll do that for all the others here. So if you repay the debt, then your reliability falls by that much. And if I include what's the net worth by putting equity inside here, so I'm going to have the uh, consumer sector's 
net worth, then all the other transactions, most of the other transactions, affect the net worth. So consumption spending by bankers ends up as a flow of money that if increases the net worth of the consumer sector and so on. And I'll go together, go through and put all those together and then provide some values for those and then show you the behavior of this system. This is now a fully defined model where I have the uh, economy being seen from the point of view of the banking sector, the consumer sector, the investment sector and workers and over to the right hand side here, it goes off screen, I have defined all the various components of that model. So for example, interest payments are the rate of interest on loans multiplied by the outstanding value of loans. And here are the flows of lending and repayment, and here is GDP down here, and the velocity of money, and the amount of money in debt in the economy. Now I can simulate this model of course, I'll just move it over a bit so I can show you all that on screen, or reduce the scale a bit. And here I have control over the rate of lending and the rate of repayment. So if I simulate this model, you'll see the amount of money in the economy doesn't change. The amount of debt rises over a while and then starts to stabilize. And if now I now say, well, let's say lending occurs much more rapidly. So the number of years it takes lending to double uh, falls from seven years to six to five and so on and so forth. Then you can see the amount of money, uh, debt rising in the economy. And there's a change in GDP as well. But if I go back to the previous level of lending, the level of debt falls, the level of GDP recovers somewhat. But if I run the model, you can now say I've been running it for 133 years, and you're still talking about effectively a stable level of GDP. Changes occurring because of changes in the velocity of circulation of money, given that uh, consumers uh, spend it at a consumer sector, consumption sector spends at a different rate to the investment sector, but not an enormous impact upon the economy itself. It's a second order thing you, you can afford to ignore. Now let's see what happens when I change this model just by saying that loans are not an asset of the consumer sector, they're an asset of the banking sector, and see what happens. This model has been produced simply by taking the loanable funds model and moving the loan from being an asset of the consumer sector across to showing that it's an asset of the banking sector, and then relocating where repayment and lending occur, and showing that interest payments are made from the uh, investment sector, which is taking out the debt to the banks, not paying it to the consumer sector. So that took about 30 seconds of just moving objects around in Minsky. Nothing else has changed in the model. If I now run the simulation, then I find for a start I get rising levels of money and debt in the economy because more debt means more money in existence. And if I change the rate of lending, so lending occurs more rapidly, then not only the level of debt rises, but also the level of GDP and particularly make change to the rate of repayment to make that take longer, then that rises even further. And if you then have a change in lending conditions so that people want to repay debt more rapidly, then you have a decline in GDP as well. So this shows the relationship between changing the level of money being created by the banking sector and changing economic conditions for the better or for the worse. Because I'm not showing things like Ponzi speculation and so on inside the model, it's too simple for that. But it illustrates the importance of including the banking sector in macroeconomics. Now that particular sophistication, being able to show multiple views of the economy uh, and be able to move uh, elements from one point to another and therefore make a simple comparison of loanable funds from Dodgers money wasn't possible before the Kickstarter funding came in. So thank you again for helping out there.